It's June 16th, 2022. This is Rook. to episode 186 of Rook. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hope you are keeping well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam. Salam. <laughs> <laughs> Salam. 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 I I was speaking so Canadian that I I, I turned into Salam. <laughs> Salam, Dustan Aziz. Durud ba shuma. Khoshum adi. Sad sol me sol. Oh my God. Uh, Salam. Salam. Pega. <laughs> We've got the Thursday crew here. We've got the Thursday crew. Uh, Smart Pega. Hello, Smart Pega. Hello, how are you? Hello, the Groovy Shia. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm Salam. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm Salam. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Today, this is an interesting one. Um, the, the question of the day, do you need a professional coach? Do you, the listener, uh, need a professional coach? Do you even need a coach? Um, now I think of you, Shia, as uh-huh. uh, as a wayward spirit, <laughs> uh, uh, a free artist, a robe wearing philosopher, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming that all of that is antithetical mm-hmm. to the idea of having a professional coach. Uh, actually, the the terminology that you just used is a bit hard <laughs> for me to, but, but, uh, but I get what you're talking yeah. about. I think I, I don't, per- personally, I don't uh, need, I think, mm. a life coach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have a uh, doctor, that's an insult to our guest who's about to walk <laughs> in the studio. We have Dr. Shahab Anari coming in. He practices something called positive psychology. Uh-huh. He's a medical doctor from in Iran. He got his, mm-hmm. uh, he became a doctor. But then he has now uh, came to Canada and, and, and he is a professional coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, he does personal okay. advising. Yes. He does uh, branding. He's a branding expert. Uh, very popular oh. on social media, uh, public speaker. But professional coach means um, it's different from a life coach. This uh-huh. is somebody mm-hmm. who professionally said to you you go to and say I, i'm assuming actually i'm going to ask him a bit <laughs> but i think what it means is you 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 know their their mission is to take somebody who has professional goals to the next level to to really help them focus those goals and, oh, and win, is it something succeed. like a manager for a music band or no i it, it's kind of that it's uh-huh. kind of that and that's why i'm gonna so i need I'm getting, I'm getting, I, I will give you my thoughts on okay. Well, I'll give you what I think my thoughts are. I have to. I wanted to speak to Dr. Shahab Anari first, but I'll give you my thoughts in just a second. First, let me ask you, Smart Pega. I mean, you have Smart yes. in the title. <laughs> Who needs a coach when that's in the title? But what are your feelings? Do you need a professional coach? I don't think so. Okay. And I, I might have a slight bias towards things like this. I'm not a big believer in coaching per se. Um, I mean, for you know, talent. Let's you have say a, a bias against things like yes, this. Yes, okay. I do. Um, and I don't know, maybe I don't know enough about it. Maybe after the interview, I'll change my mind. But I have a slight bias in the sense that for day-to-day life, if you're not a musician who needs a manager or an athlete who needs a coach, mm-hmm. um, I would say no. It's an interesting distinction. I See, I think everybody needs a manager. Everyone. <laughs> I think it's like everyone th- needs a therapist. That I agree with. Well, they're different, obviously, mm-hmm. but I think everyone could use this kind of help. Not everybody can afford it. Mm-hmm. Not everybody might need this specific type of training. But why would you think an athlete or a musician could use that type of help, but not a professional? Because I think it's a very distinct skill that, let's say, a coach is helping an athlete with or a manager is helping a musician with. Mm-hmm. But for day-to-day life, let's say, I don't know, you're just an accountant, for example. What exactly would you need a coach for? Do you just want to be an accountant or do you want to be the <laughs> best accountant? Do you want to <laughs> you, run the accounting firm? You could be the best accountant by mm-hmm. taking you know, courses that help your accounting skills and 
you know, fine tuning your accounting mm-hmm. skills by things like I that. But we can cancel our guests. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I say this with all due respect <laughs> right. to the profession. Uh, first of all, um, Shahab Banari has an amazing story himself. Uh, of you know one of the things that I've got to talk to him about is the idea that you become a, a medical doctor in mm-hmm. Iran and leave exactly the the, the profession. I wonder uh, what his parents said. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's an inevitable question. Um, but then also, how do we define professional coach? How do you become that? How do you know that's mm-hmm. that's what you're good at? What, what does it mean? And what is the transition from Iran to he lives in Canada now? Right. How does that affect your ability to guide people's lives? Um, is it the same thing in, in whatever country you're in? Uh, um, I'm curious who his, his clients are, mm-hmm. um, if they're all Iranian or not. He's very popular on social media. Mm-hmm. Oh. He does these lives and yes, that's right, Chaya. Oh. <laughs> if you were on social media. <laughs> it would be. Um, so anyway, well, Dr. Shahab Anari coming up and I will be curious to have our little um, Thursday Roundtable uh, recap after this interview to hear, hear if, you were, if he changes your mind, yes. Pega, and um, reaffirms some of what you think. Shia, yeah. Yeah. we're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It's there that you can link to all of our platforms. We are on our ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We are on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, CastBox. If you'd like to see some visuals with Rook, switch over to YouTube right now. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and in Persians, you can find them. On, you can find us on Telegram. Uh, remember, you can become a patron or supporter of this show by going to that website, rookmedia.com, and pressing the Support Us button We really appreciate it. Monday on Rook, episode 187 coming up. Shali Zomorodi makes her Mm. return to Rook uh, in advance of her appearance at the Seattle Iranian Festival, which which we will talk about. Looking forward to having Shali back. And Paymon Salimi, the musician, the uh, producer, uh, the writer, uh, he will be in the Rook studio to perform as well. So we're looking forward to that on Monday. Okay, let's get to our featured guest. Our featured guest today is an Iranian-Canadian public speaker and popular social media presence as a professional coach and personal branding expert who preaches and practices what he calls positive psychology. Dr. Shahab Anari is walking in now. He's the co-founder of a personal branding agency called North Star Success, where he helps clients across the globe to write, publish, and market their books. He's also grown a large following for coaching and advice videos and interviews and was ranked uh, among the top 25 Canadian immigrants in 2020. In 2019, Shahab published his first book entitled The How of Personal Branding, Three C's to Become the Highly Paid Authority in Your Field. And right now, Dr. Shahab Anari joins me live in the Rook studio. Hello, sir. Hi, Jian. It's an absolute pleasure, honor, and joy to be here today. Well, what a, what a pleasure it is for me. Thank you for doing this. How does one become uh, the top 25 Canadian immigrant for an entire year? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a kind of endeavor that is sponsored by RBC. Okay. And it's uh, open to public voting. So people just nominate themselves or other people nominate them. And then it's open to public voting. So the more votes you get, you the, the, the better your status All right. is. Of course, they have a panel of judges who, uh, you know, go through the everything, the credentials and the history of the candidates. But somehow I turned out to be among the top 25 in, 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 in 2020. Uh, and that was probably before a lot of your social media success, right? I've been on social media actively for the past, I would say, seven, eight years, seven okay. years uh, at least. And I've been pretty consistent. Uh, I cannot call myself successful. I, I mean, if you if you compare my following with uh, I don't know Dwayne Johnson or mm-hmm. uh, or or those guys, of course it's minuscule. But but I'm 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 creating meaningful impact, and I'm uh, that I'm very proud of. As a professional coach, would you uh, ever encourage someone to compare their following to Dwayne the Rock Johnson? Of course not. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> that that was why I was saying. Uh, what does success mean? It's uh-huh. a personal measure. And, and for me, uh, creating positive, meaningful impact, that's called success. I want to ask you about what positive psychology means. Let's get to that. But first of all, uh, you are Dr. Shahab Anari because 
you are or you were a medical doctor in Iran. Correct. You left the medical practice. How hard was that for you? Very hard. So I just to clarify, I graduated from med school. So I am a medical doctor uh-huh. by definition. Uh, of course, from Iran, I, I, I don't I don't have a license in Canada. Um, but right after graduation, I completely ditched medicine and, and diverted into, you know, training slash speaking slash um, consulting, which eventually uh, evolved into what I'm doing right now, which is professional coaching and professional training. But you said it was very hard. Why was it very hard? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, in, in the Eastern culture, especially yes. in the I- I- Iranian culture, you are supposed to become a doctor yes. uh, or an engineer or a lawyer, Dr. Mohandas, right? Yes, yes. And, and it runs in the families. Uh, and, and I can understand that because traditionally those careers um, have the safety, the security. Yes. Um, and and uh, when you become a lawyer or a dentist or a doctor, you're pretty much uh, good for life. At least it was that way uh, for a long period of time. Uh, So given the fact that those are the secure jobs and careers to have, my decision to ditch medicine and dedicate myself to something like training and coaching. Somewhat extraordinary. It it is. Yeah. And because of the status conferred upon becoming a doctor in the Eastern cultures and certainly in Iranian culture that we often talk about, um, that decision becomes something of a courageous decision in a sense because it, even if you're not passionate about it, right? I, I've heard you do a speaking gig where you said, I just wasn't passionate about being a doctor, about uh, following that path. And uh, you did all the med school. I can hear parents or society or whatever saying, well, who cares if you're not passionate about it? You know, uh, you're probably pretty good at it. You can make a lucrative living. You, you're going to have a safe life, et cetera. You're going to be set for life, as you just said. Um, so that's what you do. You do it. And um, for you to step outside of that, um, I, I mean, I don't want to make it sound extraordinary like you're saving a family in a burning house, but it is a courageous decision. It absolutely is. And um now that I look back at my decision many, many years ago, uh, I believe um, that was my calling and that was kind of my, mm, you know, purpose, I would say, in life. Uh, to, to not go to med school. No. To, to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to ins- you found your purpose, not med school, right? <laughs> kind of, that's correct. You know, not follow the what is pressured from outside, yes, yes. whether it be your, your your parents or society or whatever, uh, but instead go follow your passion, however difficult it, it might be. And, and when I say it was my purpose, now that I look back at it, I see that I've inspired a lot of people along the way. Uh, exactly. Right? I was going to say it, 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 it falls particularly within your practice because you are you are your greatest example in mm-hmm. the sense that if you're saying to people, follow your passion, follow what you call your true genius, which we'll get to, uh, they can look at you and go, well, this guy left medicine to follow his passion. And, and so there must be something to that, given that you have been successful, notwithstanding the numbers that are not the same as Dwayne Johnson's. Uh, you've, <laughs> you, yeah. you've done really well for yourself. The first thing you do in, in Iran before you come to Canada is, or one of the things you do is you become a language instructor. What, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was my first segue into the training world. So, uh, I don't know if you're aware, aware of that. I came first in the nationwide university entrance exam concours. In you Iran. you came first. Yes, I was in the country. In the country. Uh, and okay, this is uh, like one of those things where every Persian real estate agent says they they're number one. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really come? Yeah, number? yeah. It's just Google that's it. it. That's just a Google sta- it. I mean, that's <laughs> wow. I mean, even to be in the top thousand is remarkable, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so uh, I don't, I don't mean to pat myself on the back or brag. No, about no, no. My, go ahead. What, what number so, one in the concours is re- yeah, insane. So, so it's one thing to ditch medicine and follow your passion. It's another thing, totally on another level, hmm. to be the first person in concours and then <laughs> ditch medicine, because you know people say. What's going on? What the hell happened with this uh, guy? Did right. they lose their mind? Right. 
they, they including could've... your parents, I would imagine, right? Uh, what, what did honestly, they... I have to be honest here. My parents never pressured me to do medicine or training or whatever. Mm-hmm. They just said, you, you, you are a wise young man. Just mm-hmm. go decide for yourself. Right. But you, young people, even today, even in North America, a lot of young people are imprisoned, but what's socially acceptable, mm-hmm. quote unquote, mm-hmm. right? What is the right thing to do? Mm. And when we are imprisoned by that thought, by that you know, predetermined uh, prescriptions as to what is right or wrong, then you can't decide freely for yourself. You're kind of grooved into certain pathways that have mm-hmm. been decided for you. So going back to my point about being number one in concours, mm-hmm. you, ha- you hadn't mentioned that. We, we number, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so I'm, what I'm trying to get across to, to folks listening to this is that sometimes you have to make very courageous decisions mm. that comes from, you know, exploring your beliefs, uh, you know, sitting down with yourself, uh, spending time to get to know yourself, uh, delving deep into who you are, Mm -hmm. and that kind of, you know, Mm self-reflection in order to define who you want to become. Can I I just sidebar on the the number one in the concours thing? Let me, let me, understand this correctly and explain this to anybody, especially non-Iranians listening who don't know the, the way this concours thing works. To get into university in Iran, there are national tests. There's a national test called the concours, which everyone who wants to get into university participates in. So this is hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people. Yeah, in total, in across different disciplines, it's at that time it was like one and a half million people. Okay. And so you, it's a kind of a standardized test, right? Yes. And so you did this test, and you became number one out of this 1.5 million people. Uh, in my discipline, which was which was what tajrobi, they call it tajrobi, which is yeah, I don't know. Uh, folks who want to go into medicine, okay. dentistry, pharmaceutical science, and those types of things, they go to quote unquote tajrobi. So, so first of all, what I mean, do you think? How do you think you became number one? I mean, not to take anything away from what must have been incredible preparation and education and, and you know, in, in terms of, I know people cram for these tests for months, weeks, stress about them. What was it that, that catapulted you to number one, do you think? Years of hard work, I would say. No, I'm not, I'm no genius, you know, but I put in a lot of work, obviously. And it's a very competitive exam, as you mm-hmm. can imag- imagine, hundreds of thousands of people, you know, just, they, everybody wants to become a doctor mm-hmm, in Iran, mm-hmm. right? Uh, not everybody, it's a generalization, but a lot of people mm-hmm. want to become doctors or dentists. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of competition. And uh, yeah, I put in a lot of work. So here's the thing. I, I don't know that I would want to become number one in the concours. Do you know um, you know the Grammy Awards? There's an award for best new artist, best new band. You never want to be the best new artist because if you win that award, <laughs> then the expectations are so high, right? What are you going to follow that up with? If you're not the best group by two years later, then you, you failed somehow. So becoming number one on the concours, uh, I would imagine, forget parents and society and whatever and your friends and people high-fiving you. I mean, in yourself, that's a difficult thing to live up to. Yes. You remind me of Neil Armstrong. Uh, I'm pretty sure you've heard about his, his, his story after those guys you know, stepped on the moon. Right, right. Uh, almost all of them fell into depression because what? What do what, you do next? What do you right, do next? Right, right? right. What do you do for an encore? Uh, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. I'm not comparing number one in concours with stepping on the moon. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's not comparable. But but just just I, 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 I mean this honestly. I mean, you would you would know a lot about the, this more than more than me. But I, I would think it's a good way to to mess up a kid's head yeah. to become number one. That, first of all, that test is. I've got a lot of problems with. I mean, that's the the, the stress that puts yep. on young people, but um, the pressure after you win. How did you react to that? Uh, let me be a little bit vulnerable here. You know, the kind of uh, upbringing that I had, which 
uh, is quite prevalent in in a lot of Iranian educated Iranian families mm-hmm. they put a lot of pressure on kids to get high grades mm-hmm. to you know go to the best schools get admitted in the best universities and so on and so forth so I had that kind of pressure growing up honestly my, my I, I, a few minutes ago I said my parents didn't pressure me necessarily yeah. to go to university but they did pressure me to study hard for my exams yeah, yeah. to to be Uh, uh, really to do well uh, in my academics. So uh, I grew up uh, with that kind of pressure to always trying to be the best. And I carried that with myself in adulthood and over the years. And that led to a chronic disease that I have right now, which is IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, whose main cause is a stress. So... Yeah, for somebody looking from outside, they may say, oh, Shahab was number one in Concur, top 25 Canadian immigrant, or blah, 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 whatever. It's not a big deal, of course. But at the same time, I've undergone those stresses and pressures, and I'm dealing with this chronic disease. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? I know that the anxiety and the um, the, the stress that, uh, that also is intertwined with that disease you've talked about, um, became amped up when you came to Canada as well. Why, why did you come to Canada? Seem, seemingly you were doing well in Iran. Tell me about the decision to move. Uh, I would say part of it was everybody is moving to Canada. <laughs> what should we do, right? right. My, me and my wife was thinking part of it was following the crowd. Honestly, I have to be honest here. Uh, b- but another part of it was Although I should say it was 2005, right? Uh, so it's, it all started in 2009, okay, honestly. Okay. Okay. Uh, but uh, I was going to say it was slightly before the big wave of immigrants over the last 10 years. But 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 yes, we, we yeah. had been. My wife and I had been thinking about uh, immigration for, for quite a few years. But then in 2009, we started the process. Right, anyway, right. part of it was following the crowd. The other part was. Uh, the fact that I had hit a, a glass ceiling in my mm. career mm. in Iran. So I was, back then, I was a language instructor. I was doing very well, going out to sold out seminars, and my books were selling well, and so on and so forth. But then I realized there's something missing in my life. I mm. like training people. I like my job, but there's something missing. And, uh, you know, Joseph Campbell talks about the, the hero's journey, uh, and a hero is anybody like you and me. I'm not talking about a superhero. Mm. Uh, anybody can be a hero. Any any individual can be a hero. And part of that journey of us as individuals is that sometimes we go to a new geography. We change our geography. We change our geographical location in order to start a new phase in our life. So, uh, and and I when I look back at my trajectory in life, mm. I see that a lot of big changes in my career over the past 10, 15 years uh, has happened because Mm -hmm. of my decision to immigrate to Canada. Mm -hmm. So this change of geography provided me with the opportunity to start afresh, to, to have a rebirth. Maybe, maybe I'm now thinking if I had stayed back home in Iran, I couldn't have broken myself out of the mold and dared to become a new person. Right. Right? It's it, That even works on a micro level, I think. Like, I'm an advocate of of every 10 years or less or whatever of moving home, moving your house, because in the process of moving, it's ultimately a reboot to a certain extent, right? You have to, you, you go through the old boxes of your stuff. You you don't move some of the furniture. You carry over some things. You take some things off the wall. Uh, and and so it's an opportunity to, be, to re to, to begin again, if you're moving a country to a different country, it's necessarily a reboot. Although, let me just say that there's an interesting asterisk on that for Iranians moving to Toronto. Because when you say a lot of people were doing it, I I know a lot of folks, including you know cous- a cousin of mine who moved here and basically moved into a, an Iranian community and is hanging out with the same guys he, he went to Sharif University with, right? So so they've basically transplanted. It's not that much of a reboot, but perhaps in your case it was. That's right. You know, I, I cannot say I completely 
uh, you know, segregated myself from the Iranian community. Right. Of course, I have my ties, but it opened up, this move opened up a new opportunity, the, the most important of which was the the permission to define a new me, mm. right? Uh, and, and let me tell you this also. Uh, ah, the permission uh, to define a new me. Yeah. You didn't feel like you had that in Iran. You didn't have that permission. D- just as I was saying before, I believe if I had stayed in Iran, it would have been much more difficult for me to start a new career. And let me tell you this. Yes. I'm proud that despite all the difficulties, all the judgments, all the harsh critique that I received from people for my move to Canada, for me changing my career, for me starting in a new path, uh, I managed to do that. I chose to start a new career. But it's not all, you know, bells and whistles. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, not, it's not, you know, roses everywhere. People see me still now after all the hard work that I've put in, after I've established myself in my business in a new country, mm-hmm. uh, and, and uh, I've been able to impact so many people, mm-hmm. a lot of people still on social media, email, everywhere, there are a lot of people who reach out to me and say, Shahab, who are you, who are you cheating? Who are you fooling? You're a medical doctor. You would have been much more successful if you have continued in mm. that path. Mm. Or Shahab, who are you to coach people? You, you, you studied medicine in and university. And what do you say to them? That's, that's uh, I, I usually don't respond, <laughs> but uh, I mean. Well, what if I ask it right now? I mean, who are you to coach people? What do you say? I, I believe uh, you only live once. And if you don't listen to what's in your heart, what's your calling, Mm. what your intuition is trying Mm. to tell you. If Mm. you don't notice those signs, uh, at the end of the day, at the end of your life, you will look back at your life and be regretful about the decisions Mm. you didn't make. But do you think some of your, uh, when you say I'm proud that I took this path despite what people might have said or whatever, Do you think some of that pride is based in the fact that it's gone pretty well? I mean, you're a success or success slash however we define success, but you're doing well. It's it's you you are impacting people's lives. Um, If despite this being your passion, if it wasn't going as well, do you think you would still have that same pride? Probably not. But there are two things worth mentioning here. First of all, people don't see your failures because you don't advertise them. I've had so many different failures. I'm, I'm still failing in so many different things in my business. Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, people see our failures, but yeah, go ahead. Sometimes yes, they do, yes, you're yes. right. But, but we mostly, you know, we, we mostly uh, promote our successes True. and people get to True. see our successes. They don't see. Everyone looks like they're doing well on Instagram. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. Very few people yeah. know that at the end of the first year, my first year in business in Canada, I fell into depression. I started taking anxiety mm. pills, mm. and and uh, my my you know, IBD, the chronic disease that I have, went into a flare. Very few people know that. A lot of people who follow me know that I was number one in concours. I I'm top twenty five Canadian immigrant. Mm. I have a very mm. successful business. Fifteen people work for me in my mm. business, so on and so forth. But as a coach, I mean, mm-hmm. it's not a big deal, 15 people. I mean, as a coach in my industry, I'm doing pretty well. Yes. Uh, but they don't see my failures, and I've had a lot of them, and I'm still struggling with certain aspects of my business. All entrepreneurs do, right? Sure, I, I get it. I mean, you also, though, you have talked about this a bit publicly, which I, I appreciate that you say you were um, struggling based on your big ambitions. You tell the story about how you had an intervention from your doctor at one point who said, you know, this is getting dangerous. You know, you are doing too much. You're pushing yourself beyond the bounds of your health. Um, why were you pushing yourself so hard? Is, that, would, is that back to the, the kid who got the number yeah, one at the, yeah. yeah. 
yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I've done the inner work, you know, uh, because I'm a professional coach, I've done a lot of personal development and I'm, and I'm always investing in personal development. I'm now aware, maybe 10 years ago, I wasn't aware of this, but now I'm aware of that uh, this perfectionism, I might say, mm -hmm. the word is perfectionism, this is a double-edged sword. So it pushes you to become the best at what you do mm. or to be very good at what you do. And at the same time, it is very detrimental to your mental health and to your physical health. Sure. And I've experienced both sides. So accomplishment-wise, of course, I've accomplished certain things in my life. At least in my industry, I'm a respected figure. But at the same time, I, I deal with anxiety, I deal with minor depression at times, and uh, just like I said, I have this chronic stress-induced is it disease. Is it ironic that a professional coach pushes himself too hard? I mean, shouldn't you know, isn't it like a, it's like a heart surgeon smoking or something? Like, <laughs> like shouldn't you know better? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. At this moment, I'm aware of it, mm. and I try to manage it. I choose to manage it. But 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I'm 42 years old now. So over these decades of life, it has taken the toll, mm. you know, on, on my health. Two steps back, how did you, um, your decision to go into, life, into, into professional coaching is an interesting one because, and I think this is where you get some of that feedback. I, um, because um, I remember when I was writing a regular column and and um, and and I started writing a book and so and I and I spoke to a writer friend of mine and and he he was saying, well, why why don't you call yourself a writer? And I said, well, I, I'm not really qualified to uh, be a writer. And he said, well, who's qualified to be a writer? You know, people. You know how you become a writer? You start saying, I'm a writer. <laughs> and and I people probably, I know there's training you can take right now, and you teach people to coach, but people probably have this sense of self-appointed professional coaches, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have the pedigree that we know about to become a medical doctor, to become uh, a structural engineer, to become a classical musician. H how did you know you were good at this? Okay, that's a great question. So... Going back to my decision to immigrate to Canada, the immigration or the decision to immigrate gave me the opportunity and the permission to think about who I want to become next. Mm. So I was clear with the fact that I didn't want to be a language teacher anymore. That was, it was done. That was an identity I didn't want to carry over to Canada. So now the question was, okay, Shahab, who do you want to become? And that started me asking myself questions. And I started, you know, taking courses, uh, reading books, taking, doing personality assessments and, you know, working with coaches. I even uh, hired a life coach. And, and over the course of, I would say, maybe a year, I realized my strengths lie in inspiring people to become the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. And my life story was very much aligned with that. Mm -hmm. So when I thought, when I asked myself, okay, who are you qualified to serve? The answer was people representing your past. Mm -hmm. So I'm best qualified and positioned to serve. And I would say any entrepreneur, especially in the coaching, consulting, training field, the they are best positioned to serve the people who represent their past. So in my past, I was the guy who, you know, changed career. Yes. In the past, I was the guy who was not passionate about their field of study yeah. and they went into something else. In the past, I was the guy who was doing well in their business, but, they, but then they decided, I want to immigrate. Yeah, you're so, the best qualified. In, right? In, in, yes. Uh, so that was when I realized, okay, so uh, what, what, what should I learn? What should I study? What, what qualification should I get in order to become that person? But, and, you're, but you're not the best coach for everyone. You know who told right. me that? You, you told me that. Yeah. And in one of your sessions, I've seen you say uh, that you struggled in the beginning with being a life coach in terms of making it all make sense. And you said things really started to gel for you 
when you stopped trying to help everyone and you started trying to help the right people that you could serve. So what does that mean? Yes. So you cannot be a jack of all trades. In the world of business, you know this better than me, you cannot serve everybody. If you try to serve everybody, you will wear yourself too thin. You won't be impa- be able to impact people deeply in a meaningful way. And uh, eventually, nobody will take you seriously because you're not a specialist in any area. Mm. And that was a hard lesson for me to learn. I learned it very hard. After a couple of years of trying stuff out and trying to become the next Tony Robbins and trying to impact bil- billions of people across the globe, I realized, okay, this is not working. Mm. Uh, what should I do then? And then I realized I need to specialize. I need to find my niche. I need to serve uh, a particular profile, a particular avatar. Mm. And around those times, I realized, okay, the perfect avatar for me to serve, the perfect people who I can serve and create value for are people representing my past. Right. And that was when it, become, it became crystal clear for me, okay, these are the two segments of right. people who I can serve. Number one, people in transitions, mm. either immigrating or, or changing careers. Number two, people who want to build their coaching business. Yeah. And those are the two segments that I'm serving It, it actually right makes now. a lot of sense. I mean, if you, if you want to build a champion goaltender, you find a former champion goaltender to, to, to teach them the tricks, right? I mean, so do, you mentioned Tony Robbins. Does he please everyone? Uh, or does he try and help everyone? I would say yes. Of course, he says that most of his audience are entrepreneurs. But you know what? There is a difference between people who are the very first people who enter a field, the very first pioneers who mm. start a field, and those who follow. The first people who kind of open a field or make a field popular in the world, they could be generalists. Mm. They can be generalists. And he was one of those people? And he was one of those people. Uh, he's been in the business for more than 40 years. It's true, actually. Right? I think he's sort of ageless, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, Tony, I, I don't remember a time before Tony Robbins. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, but it's different for somebody like Shahab and Ari. I cannot operate like Tony Robbins because back then he was the only one. Maybe, you know, the leaders were 10 people in the world mm. and he was one of them. How specific do you need to be? I mean, how niche is your ideal client? Do they have to be a former doctor? Do they have to be Iranian? Do they have to be a a man? I mean, tell me. Uh, Of course, it takes hours and hours of discussion uh, because part of what I teach and I coach people on is to exactly get crystal clear on this this niche and specialty. And and I help folks to um, exactly define who their ideal clients are. But back to your question, I would say you are... Again, I'm repeating myself because this is very important. You are best positioned to serve the people who represent your past. Your life story is your most powerful marketing asset, I would say. Mm-hmm. You didn't totally answer my question, though. I, I appreciate the answer, but it, it, I was saying how niche. If somebody comes to you and says, you know, I was formerly a fireman, do you go, well, that doesn't exactly fit into my what my trajectory was, so I can't help you? Or do you say, oh, I can sort of imagine you know, your situation? That's a very good question. Because the folks that I serve are either people in transition or coaches slash trainers who want to build their business, when I'm talking about picking a niche or specialty, I'm mostly helping coaches and trainers. I see. So I won't help like firemen or other types of entrepreneurs mm. or other types of professionals. But... Back to your question, how specific should the niche be? There are two ways to go about it. Number one, do a market research, either by yourself or hire a marketing company to do that for Mm. you. Number two, which is the most usual way, is to look at the leaders in the market, look who they are Mm. uh, targeting, what has been successful in the market, and you know, try to copy them, try to model them. So, for example, if you see that there are certain folks in the market who are targeting, let's say, parents, and this is a big market, that's it's working for them, they're making good money, they're creating value, they're creating impact, okay, you can be the next one in that market. But if there is nobody who is coaching, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm just trying to make stuff up, uh, 
owners of rabbits in Toronto, mm -hmm. then probably it's not a great idea to be mm -hmm. the next uh, coach for owner rabbit owners. Rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> who, who will speak for the owners of rabbits? <laughs> One of the things you've said that I, I really appreciate, one of your key points is to stop, quote unquote, racing against time. I wish I knew how to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing what you mean by that is to um, not overwhelm oneself with the stress that I'm, time is going to run out, I'm going to get old, I'm going to die, I'm going to have to uh, you know, figure it all out, etc. Um, but how do ambitious people negotiate that with themselves, especially when we're living in a society where we're told, I mean, depending on what your occupation is, if you're an athlete, if you're a, if you're a dancer, if you're a rock star, you know, um, you may have a best before date, you know, you may need to um, be the best ballerina before you're 35, you know, um, or uh, if you're writing some great opus, you know, you need to get it out there before your your energy uh, flags or something. I mean, how, how do we reconcile that? Yeah, that's a very good question. And that's a very hard thing to do. So I would say patience is a much needed virtue in today's world for anybody who wants to become successful, including entrepreneurs. And in the world, in our world, uh, which is a world of instant gratification. Mm. You just click on a link and it opens up within milliseconds and you just order groceries on Uber and you know order on Amazon and next day uh, your, your package is on your right. doorstep. Right. It is. It has become very hard for folks to play the long game. And uh, I'm not preaching this because I'm you know better than others. I'm struggling with this all the time myself, mm -hmm. but I'm aware of it at least. And I try to, you know, modify my behavior mm -hmm. uh, and play the long game and, and, and have this long view of life. So when we look at what's, uh, you know, the research in positive psychology, I, I, I'm sure you've heard about the 10,000 hour rule and the, the, the book by Malcolm Gladwell, course, yeah. which, which comes from, you know, researches and studies of uh, Dr. Erickson, mm -hmm. exactly, uh, in positive psychology. So it takes a few thousand hours of dedicated, uh, deliberate practice, uh, equaling to a few years of dedicated, deliberate practice for somebody to uh, master any area of expertise to become a world-class player. Mm. Um, and, and, and by the way, the 10,000 hour is not set in stone. It could be lower or higher. For Nobel Prize mm -hmm. winners, it could be 40,000 hour, right, hours, right, and, right. and they sometimes spend 40 years to, to reach that level of mastery. So it's an but I've always I've always liked that Malcolm Gladwell thing, because partly because I, I don't think you can ever bullshit your way into being mm -hmm. great. You know, the uh, one thing that I've learned having interviewed a lot of very successful people uh, over the years, I always say this to folks, even even folks who, even if you don't like the person, you know, even if they're some pop star or some author or some opinionator you don't like, if they've achieved a great deal of success, if they're amongst the tops in their field, they've usually worked their ass off. Yeah. They've usually put in those thousands and thousands of hours. It's really, really exceptional to find somebody who, who's sort of lucked into it, you know? Yeah. And, and folks tend to gravitate into, you know, stories like, Instagram got picked up by Facebook within one and a half years and for billions of dollars. Exactly. Those are outliers. Those do exist, of course. Now, when we look at the st statistics, it's a bell curve, right? Mm -hmm. Most folks, most examples, most instances fall into the middle of the curve. So those are the folks who need to spend thousands of hours, who need to spend a few years at least, mm -hmm. in order to reach that level of mastery. Going back to your point, there is no royal road to success. All right. But, you know, this racing against time thing, it also goes back to that point that you made earlier about how we define success. Because, you know, for the octogenarian billionaire 
who is still killing themselves for 16 hours a day to make more money, you sort of think, well, what, what's that person doing? But they've got some idea of success that is seems warped but what it, you know that is 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 driving them still probably against the the recommendations of their doctor to make more money make more money more acquisition right so it's a tough one to 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 you know that 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 race against time i mean i at the same time i maybe it's my own ambitions or my own persian upbringing or whatever whatever it is sometimes when i see somebody who isn't applying themselves and I think, man, you know, come on, you've got so much potential, you're wasting your time, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it's my place to say that about somebody, but but so there's that sweet spot somewhere between, you know, not trying to um, uh, race against time, but at the same time, uh, apply oneself. I don't know how to find that. Yeah, and that's exactly the point. Uh, it's It's not the same for everybody. When you say, you're wasting your time, says who, right? Right? Because you're making assumptions, or let me be a little bit more harsh, you're judging people based on your value system. And they, yeah, that they, smoking pot and watching The Simpsons for 10 hours a day is, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's so much more to, to enjoy or to do, but you're right, that's a judgment. Yeah, 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 because uh, values are things that are important to us. For example, for that billionaire that you mentioned, their, their top value may be like working 18 hours a day. Their top value may be uh, creating jobs for more people. Uh, really though, I mean, if you were the professional coach for a, an 80 year old billionaire who's working 16 hours a day, wouldn't you say, dude, enough already? Never. <laughs> you wouldn't? No, 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 I wouldn't. Because I never judge them, at least I'm trained not to judge them. Mm. And I'm trained to help them define what success means to them, but, right? But what if they haven't spoken to their kids in years and you go, isn't this an opportunity for a, you know? Of course we are talking about extremes, but that might not be their value. Uh, of course we are talking uh -huh. about extremes, right. but uh, in a normal human being, of course, probably, you mm. know, family would be high on their priority list. But again, every single individual is different. They have, people have different values and, uh, Going back to the point about racing against time, the individual needs to decide what success means to them. Interesting. So you're not a counselor. No. You're a coach. You're taking what somebody says, I want to get from here to there. Mm -hmm. You don't judge it. You don't say, oh, you think that's a good idea? You say, okay, I can enable that for you. Yes, exactly. Oh. So, so professional coaching, by definition, if I may share that definition with you and your audience, professional coaching is a partnership between the coach and the client mm. in a creative and thought-provoking process that enables the client to maximize their personal and professional potential. Got it. So it's different from counseling or therapy or consulting in the way that it's a partnering. Uh, we are equal to the client. We never judge them. We, are, we, we all, we, the only thing we do is use our competencies and skills mm -hmm to empower them to go from point A to point B. And that includes a lot of things, including helping them overcome their mental blocks and change their value systems and change their beliefs and equipping themselves with, you know, the, the much needed skills and tools that are necessary. Does, does to their the success. need for a professional coach ever end? Do you, I mean, it seems like it would be something that once once somebody gets into it, I mean, is, have you ever had a client where you go, you know what, I think we're done. I think you, you, <laughs> you don't need me anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is an end to any coaching relationship. So coaching relationships rarely go on forever, right? But uh, the need for growth and personal development and uh, higher awareness, that never ends, right? So you've... Um got this uh, book on personal branding, the how of personal branding. And I just want to, it's got the three C's and I want to lead you through the three C's and, and maybe very briefly, you can give us a, um, and, and interestingly, you are on brand because you've already mentioned all the, all three of these things throughout our conversation. But the first is clarify. So this is, as I understand it, um, know who 
your audience, tar- who your target audience is for whatever you're trying to do, right? Yeah. So Clarify is all about getting very clear on three things. What do you do, who you do it for, and how you're different, right? And it doesn't matter what business you're in, whether you're a restaurant owner or a coach or a financial advisor, you have to be very clear about your ideal client, the value that you bring to them, Mm -hmm. and how you stand out Mm -hmm. from your competitors. A lot of folks go into different businesses and they think, okay, I'm going to do well because I'm going to be a little bit cheaper than others. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say I provide uh, the quality that is a little bit better than uh, Mm -hmm. others. A little bit cheaper and a little bit better won't work in today's market. Nobody is looking for a little bit cheaper or a little (laughs) bit better. And that's, you know, the thought process of so many people, so many entrepreneurs. You have to stand out. You have to be different. You have to have a unique promise of value, right? You have to promise something of value that is relevant to your audience, which is defined by you, Uh which is unique, unique promise but of value. the other part of it which it, which you mentioned is in terms of the target audience that and we talked about this a little earlier um, with Tony Robbins etc but but you you also say don't try and please everyone so if that restaurant uh, the person who's opening the restaurant I'm opening a steakhouse and you say well who's your target audience and I say everyone I want everyone to come to my steakhouse you think that's a mistake of course that's a mistake because Steak is not everyone's favorite. Everyone has a different taste. And and even uh, a restaurant who offers a steak uh, on their menu, there are different shades of, you know, even mm-hmm. that specialty. Mm-hmm. There are different kinds of that specialty. We have a steak But isn't house. it noble or, or a smart business to try and get everybody I can into the door? No, that's, that's the wrong way to think about it. Because just like I said, if you want to please everybody, if you want to go after everybody, you will wear yourself too thin. Mm. You don't have the budget to go and you know, right. advertise to everybody. You don't have the time. You have to have to, to add find. tofu to the menu. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And, and, and that's why, you know, McDonald's never allows the franchisees to add whatever they want to the menu. It's a brand. It's it's something defined. Mm. It's a unique promise of value. You uh, and, and, and to the other extreme, uh, when you go to Versace or Gucci or those types of brands, mm-hmm. they don't offer, I don't know, the, 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 a hairpin might be $2,000 right, in, in right. those stores right. because they have a certain ideal client, they have a certain value proposition, and they are attracting certain people. It's not for everyone. Mm. The second of the C's in your, um, it's the letter C we're talking about, not the not oceans C's, uh, is communicate. Seems obvious. Why is communicate one of your three C's? Because a lot of folks, after they clarify who they are, what they do, who they serve, and how they're different, they just sit there and wait for people to miraculously show up at their door. If you're a dentist, if you're a coach, if you're a restaurant owner, you, you can't just open the door and, and hope that clients, you know, walk through the door. You have to communicate your value to your audience. You have to communicate your message. You have to create awareness Mm. in the market. And that's what's called marketing in in the business world, right? So look at all these, uh, I'm doing my best to be polite, but all these psychologists and coaches and entrepreneurs who are broke, a lot of them have the skills they are very good at what they do. They have, they have gone through the training. Mm. They, they can offer a lot of value, but they don't have customers. They don't have clients. Nobody knows them. Why? Because they're not communicating their value to the audience. They're not marketing. And, and some of that comes, some of that happens because, because folks are not trained in marketing and sales. And some of that comes because uh, they have a kind of aversion to sales. They think marketing is bad. It feels cheap. It or, feels cheap. Mm-hmm. I'm not a salesperson. I'm a dentist. I've, I've, I've been through college or I have this mm-hmm. degree. Mm-hmm. But you don't want to manipulate people. Sales is not about manipulation. Mm-hmm. Promoting yourself is not about projecting a fake image. You are 
communicating the true value that you can bring to the table. Folks are dying out there trying to find the solution to their problem, and you can provide that solution. It's on you to communicate your value to those audience so that you two can meet and you can help them and solve their problem. So it's not cheap. It's actually your destiny. It's, it's something you have to do. It's, it's Did we always have to do it or is that because of the kind of world we live in today? I mean, the amount of people I've spoken to, you know, a great author, for example, who has a book coming out and the, and the publisher says, you got to start a, a Twitter account, you got to start Instagram, you got to start, you know, being active on social media. And they go, I... My plan was to write a great book. Now I have to be a social media person. That's kind of the curse of the 21st century, right? I wouldn't I wouldn't consider it a curse. I would say that's the game we're playing right now. But but the dentist, really a dentist, I mean, why should a dentist have to be good at marketing? I want them to be good at fixing my teeth, right? Uh, those are the two you know, the two skill sets that they need to possess in order to be successful in today's world. Yes, a dentist needs to be very good at their dentistry, mm. but if they want to be successful in business, they have to be good at marketing too. And I don't mean they have to be the marketer themselves. I see, right, yes. They can hire a team right, to right. do the marketing for them. But if you sit at in, in your office lonely, looking at the door, <laughs> waiting for people to walk into, right. into your room, and you become bitter at your fellow dentists and, and, and competitors out there who are doing well, and you belittle them because they are good at marketing and they're attracting a lot of clients, bad on you. Mm, yeah, uh, you're right. I, I, it just makes me feel a bit sad that everybody has to, I mean, I, I get we live in this era of, People, everybody, everything's a brand. Everybody's a, a brand, and 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 if you sit in the dentist office alone, somebody else will because it's a competitive world too. And so, uh, but I, there's something about it that feels um, uh, it feels rat racy. You know, not necessarily. It, it it all it all comes back to how you view the situation. Is it a challenge, or is it an opportunity? Is it sad, going back to your choice of word, is it sad <laughs> or is it was, exciting? It's just a feeling I have. Uh, yeah, yeah, Don't uh, judge me, coach. No, no, no I'm, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. I'm trying to challenge you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. I, I'm saying you can reframe your perspective. You can look at the situation with a fresh pair of eyes. Is it truly sad or is it exciting? Uh, you know, the same thing happened when cell phones came into the market. Some folks were just, no, this is for kids. Who wants to learn how to play with, this, with these gadgets? Yeah. Or right now, let's talk about Web 3.0, NFTs, a metaverse. It's up to each one of us to uh, respond to this situation. Is it yeah. a challenge? Is it an opportunity? Is it sad that we need to learn how to operate in Web 3.0? Or is it an opportunity? I don't have the all, all the answers, but I can say with 100% certainty that it's up to us to choose how we want to respond to every situation. The third C is close. Like you mean close the deal, right? Exactly, close the deal. It's all about sales. Every single one of us is a salesperson. Whether we <laughs> agree or not, whether we like it or not, we are negotiating with other folks all the time. Mm. And I don't mean we are you know, used car salespeople. I'm saying we're selling our ideas, we're selling our perspectives, we're selling our products, we're selling our services, we're selling ourselves mm. as the experts in the market as the uh, you know go-to person in the market so again it's our choice how we want to respond to this you know notion that we are all salespeople. do we want to say that sales is cheap uh, and, and let me tell you this mm. some folks um, have this negative attitude towards sales and salespeople because they have uh, had bad experiences with salespeople. Mm. Uh, some people have ripped them off. Uh, they have 
they have had bad experiences with people who have tricked them, cheated on them, and so on and so forth. So I get that, I understand that, and I empathize mm -hmm. with them. But that doesn't mean that sales has to be that way. Salespeople have to be manipulative. No, no, you get to choose how you want to but operate in this world. we also all have experiences with that person. Maybe it's a, an old friend of us or ours or something who's constantly on Instagram or on uh, Facebook or something going, here's my new song, here's my new song, here's my, yeah, here's my new product or whatever. And you go, enough already. I mean, I'm, you know, I didn't sign up to be yeah. receiving your barrage of ads, right? So there's a line that you don't want to cross, exactly. surely. Exactly. Well, I don't want to go into too many, you know, specifics, but that's uh, how I think about it. I would say 80 to any rule. So if you want to be on social media or if you want to have this ongoing communication with your contacts, 80% of it should be all about creating value. And 20% of it could be about your business, promoting your products, promoting your offers, and so on and so forth. So just roughly, we could say, out of the five posts that you post, four posts should be solely for the purpose of creating value for your audience. Mm. Uh, and, and I'm not talking just about social media or Instagram. In whatever communication you have with other folks, make most of it about creating value. Mm. And value means a different thing to different people. Value could be entertaining them. Value could be educating them. Value could be uh, providing a good nugget of wisdom or inspirational quote mm. uh, to, to uh, lighten up their days. Whatever value means to you, create value for people most of the time, but allow yourself to talk about your business uh, and, and allow yourself to promote yourself and communicate mm. the value that you bring to the table every now and then. Because if you don't, you will be the best kept secret in the world. When you say everyone needs to be a salesperson, I mean, does a how does a nurse who's working in a hospital need to be a salesperson. If they want to get promoted, they need to sell their expertise to their boss, right? If you want to if they want to get into that research team, that high-end re research team, if they want to get into that uh, that really uh, interesting project at their uh, at their hospital, mm. uh, whatever the case might a be. A grade 3 school teacher. Same thing. If they want to get promoted, it, it, it works across the board. If you want to get promoted, if you're in the corporate world, if you want to get promoted, mm. for some some folks may say, well, the I don't world want to get I get. I mean, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm wondering if you're a civil servant, for example. What, but I, I, mean, I hear what you're saying. I let's, mean, let's talk about the family. Everybody has a family, right? Yes. If you want to convince your wife or your husband or your kids <laughs> to go to yeah. right, Hawaii right, instead right. of, I don't know, Mexico, that's, that's a sales conversation. You're selling your idea. What a horrible way to look at families, <laughs> beautiful Persian families living harmoniously. I understand it. I understand it. You look, there's something that you um, that you wrote in your, you've got this book that's a daily planner, right? And um, one of the things that's interesting to me, so you've got a daily, uh, this, this, you, this is for what? For uh, people to help be able to plan their life, yeah. right? To, and I, it's great. I mean, I as somebody who is an organized person and who likes organized people, this is like I get excited looking at this. Right? I get this is my uh, my porn here, you know. <laughs> but um, in your daily planner, you've got some intentions for the day. Your intentions are. Uh, I, what am I going to put as my major goal of the day? I, that's understandable. Um, preset task or appointment for the day. Uh, people I need to con connect with. All natural. Then you've got one category is who I want to be. Yeah. Each day. Yeah. So you you think that people each day should wake up and decide who we want to be? Yeah. It's very, very interesting. What does it mean? Of course, I'm not. When, when I say who do you want to be today? Uh, I'm not talking about you know starting a new career or or, or changing your identity forever. Mm. I'm the the question is mainly concerned with the fact that what qualities you want to express, what uh, values do you want to honor, what um, attributes of your higher self you want to express to the world. So who you want to be, let the answer could be, I want to be 
the kind person who smiles at strangers. That's it. You know, you set the intention for the day and you go about your life with that awareness, mm. which impacts, you know, the color of your day. Did you set an intention today? I did. Uh, who, and, who do you uh, want to be? <laughs> <laughs> the smiling guy. That, that was the example that I just shared, you know, the smiling guy. Um, before I let you go, it's very interesting getting to talk to you. Thanks for doing this. It's, Thank you for it's having me. It's been a really, really um, invigorating conversation for me. I really I have enjoyed it. Um, let me ask you, first of all, there's a service aspect to what you do, right? Would you say so? Feels like you're giving back to people. How, how do you balance that and the ambition to want to make a lot of money? Very good question. So I said boundaries. So... I don't want to talk about it openly right now because you have a very big audience and I'm honored to be on your show. But I, I you know, donate to charities every month, uh, both in North America and in Iran. I uh, give my some of my courses away for free to certain people, especially in Iran. And sometimes I give, uh, I don't know, free coaching sessions, pro bono coaching, we call it pro bono coaching, to people and or organizations. I'm not sharing this to pat myself on the back. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, but I have a boundary for that. For example, one person per month gets the free coaching, pro bono coaching. Two people per month, I will give away courses to them. Mm. So if a third person comes to me and asks for a free course, we won't do it. Mm. So that way, we, we are not a charity. We are a business. We want to you know, create value for ourselves and for our audience. And at the same time, I'm happy that, that uh, I can help folks around, uh, along the way. That's such a great, it's a, a, a really well thought out way of doing that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, what, what have you most learned about why people seek your help? They resonate with my story. So a lot of folks come to me because they are missing something in their life. They want to make that transition, whether it be immigration or changing careers or, you know, starting a new business, especially in the coaching, training, consulting field. And they look at my story and they see that I'm not projecting myself as the superhero. I'm being vulnerable about my story. I'm sharing the ups and downs that I had in mm. the first few years. And I still, I'm still struggling with certain things in my business. I don't wanna, I never, uh, you know, try to, 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 uh, imbo to, to show myself as the invincible guy. And folks resonate with that. They, they and, and, and by the way, there's another thing. I place huge emphasis on ethics in my work. I'm a professional coach. I operate by the code of ethics of ICF, International Coaching Federation, which is the governing body of professional coaches throughout the world. And you know what? A lot of people, when they hear the word coach, they run away. They hmm. run the, uh, in the other direction because there, there are so many self-proclaimed coaches who are damaging the reputation of coaches and they're you know, hurting people. They're not providing value. But I pride myself on the fact that I abide by the code of ethics. I serve people. I create value, and I stand by, uh, you know, the ethical conduct and and you know, uh, the professionalism that my industry expects of me. Good to have you here. Thanks Thank for doing for, this. Thank you for having Hoş me. Hoşçakalın, Dr. Shahab Anari. An Iranian-Canadian public speaker, popular social media presence, a professional coach, personal branding expert. His 2019 book is called The How of Personal Branding, Three C's to Become the Highly Paid Authority in Your Field. Shahab Anari, join me here live in the Rook studio today. Dr. Shahab Anari has walked out of the studio. Smart Pega is back here. Groovy Shia, the microphone's back on. 
Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> for you pessimists, <laughs> for you non-believers, uh, that was an invigorating conversation. Oh, yeah, I really, yeah, I really very. enjoyed. It. First of all, the guy was number one in, concours. in the concours. Yeah. That's amazing. That's actually. amazing. Right? Yeah, I mean, the feel that like in a tajrobi becoming the number one is really difficult. I told you that I also I am a number one yeah. in a azad konkur in a like ensani and so, but that's that is that is very different. Like difficult. in other words, there's one person a year, yes, who becomes number one, one like top one, yes, number yes, one, yes. Uh, I felt bad. I was like, are you like a real estate agent that gets <laughs> <laughs> claims he's number one? He's like, um, it was in the newspaper. Uh, right? You can Google me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, wow. So um, so I'm very curious because I thought, uh, first of all, I love, I'm very interested in his journey. Mm -hmm. um, and he clearly imparts a sense of confidence in in his field in terms mm -hmm. of what he's doing Peggy um, before the interview you said that you're not sure about professional coaching and mm -hmm. whether people need professional coaches and so how are you feeling well first of all his story was fascinating I was I learned quite a bit like um, what? Well, the, the part about personal branding, I thought that was fascinating. I had never looked at it that way. So, you know, even a dentist needing personal branding like that was eye-opening for sure. Um, I can see why there might be an, a certain market for it. So there might be certain professions or individuals who would need it. Um, but I'm still not 100% sold. Mm. I, think, I think it's still a niche um, requirement. Hmm. Mm hmm uh, Shia, what, how did you feel about? Actually, he said something that I'm still thinking of. That that if you don't do anything, you you remain the biggest secret of the world. And yes, you know, it it. I, I mean, I, right now I don't have. Any that, that was around the the impetus to promote oneself yeah, on social media yeah, and things if, like yes, that. Yeah. yeah, if you don't promote yourself, you yeah. remain. And the it's biggest. so true. Like, how many people yeah. do we know who are? Yeah. Re remarkably talented and they and they they aren't known outside their kitchen because they yeah. they don't um and I, and yet i'm sympathetic to people who don't want to play that game too mm -hmm. it's a tough one yeah i have you know like I, I i used to be on social media but it's been a year that i i i quit all the social media and i feel that i am kind of less stressed actually yes. and but at in the other hand i feel the stress that maybe I remain the biggest secret in the world and uh, yeah so it's a very it's a tough dilemma that I quit I social media for a while once and and um, a few years back and and it was incredibly liberating mm -hmm. uh, but and you don't miss that much you realize that there's you know the the, yeah. the the need to I mean for example Twitter the need to check every Twitter every 10 minutes to find out what's happening what's happening what's mm -hmm. happening you really once you don't have it for a while yes. you realize that you're really not actually missing that much you're no. missing the fact that a uh, hippopotamus ended up on the <laughs> california highway and there's yeah. video of it you know or, or or there's been another airstrike on something but you know it's really not but the part that you do miss if you believe um what um chow banari was saying is is the um the platform and the opportunity and the uh, importance of of personal branding of building your your brand it's a really tough one i'm still having trouble as i said to me you know i know authors that yeah. they're, they're they're like i got into this to write books not to be send witty zingers <laughs> on instagram you know or yeah. uh and so the idea of everyone having to sell themselves mm -hmm. still feels a bit sad to yeah. me a little yeah. bit yeah there was something else that he said that i found incredible where he was talking about um the change in geography and giving himself permission to become a new version of himself mm. i thought that was amazing i had never even thought about the idea of that fresh start moving from one place to another and that giving him the permission to allow for that big of a change yeah i think that's a really that's an important one because um so many of the people that we're talking to right now in the diaspora are people who've ultimately migrated from one place to another mm -hmm. usually from Iran but uh, in some cases from Iran to somewhere and then to somewhere else uh, and that it really is a a restart mm -hmm. uh, and a, and a, a an opportunity start. for rebranding although yeah. I'm not sure that everybody takes it I mean there's difficulties that come with it but I think the fact that he used the word permission was what really 
kind of was eye-opening to me. It was almost like he was saying, you know, in the environment that he was in before, he couldn't give himself that permission. Mm. But with the change in geography, that allowed him to give himself that permission. But can we just go back to the um, selling yourself thing? Yes, it's everyday question for me, literally. <laughs> mm. Like if, even if even if I when I have social media, like uh, I, I I I I'm not that personality to like. Sh- promote myself you know mm-hmm. i hate yeah. to promote myself I, yeah. I i don't know what do i have to do and all the people say oh you have to do something you have to but yeah. I, don't, I don't know what yeah it's a double-edged sword because you put yourself out there and it allows for more judgment but at the same time if you don't put yourself out there then it's going back to what but there's also uh, it's also I, I think it first of all i think it might be generational but although there's certainly people in their 40s 50s and 60s mm-hmm. and 70s who are promoting themselves but but um, Donald Trump, you yeah. Know. But but there there is something that um, you know when I was a kid and, and a teenager and then in much in 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 kind of alternative art, artsy circles anyway or mm-hmm. whatever that would be that I was in, uh, it was considered uncool to mm-hmm. be um, braggadocious to be pr- promoting yourself, mm-hmm. and and also growing up in Canada, you know, Canada is not. A place that's traditionally um, looked positively upon people who are highly self-promotional. You know, it's it's kind of um, you know, there's these famous moments in Canadian history where where you know they'll be interviewing Wayne Gretzky and saying, "Oh, you scored this many goals in one season. How did you possibly do it? It's so incredible. You set the record." And he kind of goes. Um, yeah, you know, I had a good team and <laughs> I got lucky and, you know, they, yeah. anything but I'm the greatest, right, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And uh, it was always considered kind of American, forgive me, American friends, but to <laughs> American to be like, I'm the greatest. And yet now it seems like that's the game in social media. Yeah. And it's almost fueled by hip hop stars and, and business people and, you know, that, that we're all supposed to just say, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, nobody will believe you're mm-hmm. the best. I, I don't want to reduce what he was saying to that. I mean, yeah, he, I, he's not necessarily, but the idea of selling yourself feels like that. Uh, yeah. Feels like I have to kind of constantly hammer it into people what my accomplishments are. And yet, it's that paradox is exactly what you talk about, which yeah. is that if you don't, I mean, this happens to me all the time because I never talk about stuff from my, and people go, you you sold f- half a million records, you know, the songs <laughs> yeah. you wrote, and, yeah, you know, uh, and then I think, am I supposed to be saying this more regularly? <laughs> That so people know, you know, yeah. that I, I sat with Paul McCartney and did an interview or something, you know? <laughs> but oh, it's also- oh, really? You, you interviewed Paul McCartney? <laughs> See, you're being funny? No. Yeah, I interviewed wow. Paul McCartney. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> See? See? <laughs> I'm doing a shit job of <laughs> selling myself. I was going to say, it's also culturally, like as Iranians, I think we're taught to be humble too. So uh, that self-promotion. Uh, well, I mean, I know it's changing now, I guess. No, but are we? Yeah, I mean, I've always... I find Iranians are the most self-promotional. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I they grew up like my mom telling me like, it's not nice to brag and you have to be humble and, uh-huh. you know, let other people tarif gone on. Mm. So... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I feel like my mom says that for, is definitely in that category, yeah. but, but I, I don't. I don't know. I think. I mean, I think it's shifted now, but I think if we're looking at culturally, at least from what I know, that's always been the case. Mm. But you know, in a social media age, he's not wrong. It's a. It, in terms of professionally, it's a competition, yeah. mm-hmm. and if you're not selling yourself, you're getting left behind. I mean, yeah. it's not always social media either. He's not suggesting everybody has to run to Twitter, to Instagram, or something. Mm-hmm. But, but he, he, even in the office, even on the construction site, even in the in the music circles, it's it's ultimately you have to find ways of selling yourself. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to get the advancement. You're not mm-hmm. going to get the respect. You're not going to get the raise. I think with social media, it's also the overload and volume of information that's being thrown at us. So it's like this almost race to make sure that you're putting yourself out there. Mm. So with social media, at least it's that way. But he was saying something about, you know, you can't just sit back and expect your audience or your demographic mm. that you're targeting or whoever yeah. else to come to you. You have to make an effort. Yeah. yeah. The other thing was, and we, we touched on the, on this in the interf- interview, but I, I think people are, in terms of your cynicism earlier, Pega, mm-hmm. about... I don't want to overplay it. You were you, you weren't unkind, but you were saying you're not sure about this whole professional coaches yeah. thing. And I wonder if that's partly because 
uh, we don't have a very clear guideline of what the education requirements mm-hmm. are, what the diploma says, what the um, what the status is, uh, especially in the Iranian community. It's like I, I got my degree, I got my master's. Here's here's the piece of paper Definitely. that says I'm a doctor. Here's what says I'm a mohandes. <laughs> and I was giving the example of the writer. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's true for a musician too. Yes, mm-hmm. you can go to a music school, but ultimately. Uh, you become a musician when you start calling yourself a musician. Right. And I think it's kind of like that with professional coach. I mean, when he was talking about the cynicism with him and people saying, oh my God, you were a doctor. What are you doing? You know, it's because the, there's a feeling of, well, why do you get to be a professional coach? Yeah. How do I know? Which is the same thing people say to to hockey coaches or music managers or whatever until they're successful, mm-hmm. you know, and then it's mm-hmm. like, oh, that's a great coach. Yeah. But um Maybe is that where some of your... Yeah, and I think, you know, I had never actually had anyone in this profession explain the way he did, um, you know, kind of where he started and and what his journey was and, you know, how he helps individuals and and really dig into what it is that they do as a profession. So, you know, like I said, it was eye-opening for me. And at the beginning, I said, maybe I don't know enough about it. And I think that was part of it is that I had never really heard what the intricacies of it was. I, I said earlier that I think everybody should have a manager. I, I really do think that anyone could, that I can't think of someone who couldn't use somebody helping to captain their, their path, you know, <laughs> helping to guide. Because you first of all, in your own life, you don't see um, all, all that's around you the same right. way somebody else would, you know. Um, and second of all, to help, the, 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 just with organization of decision making, mm-hmm. what what am I going to do? What's what's the? I, I just think I would I crave that. I think oh my god, <laughs> somebody to tell me that this is this is the best time to get dinner and you know here's what you should do tonight to be most productive and here's here's the right path to having a good day tomorrow. I mean, why mm-hmm. wouldn't you want that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not that I wouldn't want it, but I think there's something to be said for self-discovery, mindfulness, exploration of the self. Like these are all things that, you know, now we have (laughs) access to this kind of information and we can learn to do, right? And I think ultimately, even he was saying- But he can help you with that. Yeah. I mean, they could help you say, okay, here's your, now spend some time doing (laughs) (laughs) self-discovery. Fair enough. As your professional coach, I'm saying this, I haven't even taken a, I got to do a professional (laughs) coaching with him. but although I've done life, I've had, been to a life coach. I know it's different. Mm-hmm. I go to a therapist. Yep. I've had managers and agents. Okay. So, you know, yeah. and promoters. He, actually, he changed my mind about the having it. I mean, I would yeah. love to be one of his charity clients. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I don't think we can afford But me too. I changed my mind too. Yeah. I thought, well, he didn't change my mind, but he, he reaffirmed for me that yeah. the idea that this is something that yeah. could be very helpful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, Groovy Shia, Smart Pega. Thank you again to Dr. Shahab Anari for coming into the Rook Studio. And uh, check him out on social media. Uh, he has a big following, and he's a, there's a reason for that. He's got some very, very um, sagacious <laughs> things to say. Sagacious coming from the word sage. Oh, wow. Wise, yeah, right? interesting. Sagacious. Sagacious. This is full time for Rook for today. Our website, rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com is where you can find all things to do with this program and our other programs on the Rook Media Network, where you can uh, find out how to support us, see our guests, our previous episodes, our funnies, our videos, etc. Rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Savvy Roham, talented Anahita, Ponta the Artist, the Fabulous Keon, Super Parisa, Smart Mega, Ahai Merdog, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already on any of our platforms. Monday, we're back with Shali Zomorodi and Paymon Salimi as our guests. Don't miss it. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. And as ever, Easy Russian.